So I'm excited to have today, if you're joining us, you're here for the community healing and an ancestral wisdom model for BIPOC community care. So our presenters are Amelia Romo Olivas. Um, she is a woman of Atikawa Pagwame clan of the Tepilam Kwawiltakwan nation, a Chicana culture worker, organizer, and practitioner of traditional healing from her homelands of Yanawana, currently known as San Antonio, Texas. Amelia works part-time at TASA's Collective Healing Initiative, CHI, and she is co-founder of San Arte Healing and Cultura Clinic Collective, where a passion for community wellness, culturally affirming healing spaces, and justice for BIPOC folks everywhere come together. And the other presenter is Rebel Mariposa, um, Rebel Mariposa is a Yanawana-based native queer Tejana with a passion for ancestral healing through food, art, and activism. Rebel possesses an invigorating spirit of initiative that is deeply interwoven in cultura and indigenous roots. She is the chef and owner of the highly acclaimed and nationally recognized La Botanica, Texas' first vegan restaurant, bar, and venue. In addition, she is a co-founder of Sana Arte, a community-led cultural healing collective. Rebel is a change maker and trendsetter, always centering healing in her work. I would like to thank you both for joining us today, and we are so excited to see y'all present. Thank you so much for that introduction, Courtney. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, selecting this session. I know you have options. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So as Courtney said, um, this session is um, community healing and an ancestral wisdom model for BIPOC community care. Um, and so uh, we're we're going to lead you all through a series of some of uh, th this model, right? It's a model. Um, you know, we our hope is that the folks who are here, you're passionate about um, expanding um, and transforming systems, right? Um, and you're curious and you have an open mind and you're here um, to explore what the possibilities are um, for community care, for whole person, um, whole, whole community centered healing. So Without further ado, so we we always start out with the land acknowledgement. Um, you know, our collective um, does that, um, and T Tasa has had a land acknowledgement in the past, and so this is actually a picture of one of the land the, on the top left corner of the land acknowledgement of the last in person conference that we had in San Antonio, um, and so. Um, you know, just for the folks who are in actually the, uh, the Austin area as well. We're on the lands uh, called Yanawana and Somisek uh, by the bands known as Kwawitekan peoples and Estogna peoples. Um, and so to just remember, remember who has stewarded the land, remember um, the people who are still here. Um, a lot of history books and textbooks uh, say that we are extinct. This is not the case. Um, and we are still stewarding the land and, and learning and revitalizing language and ceremony um, and what that means for us and our connection to the land. So uh, we hope that you get, um, you get some of that from this session. Um, my name is Amelia. Um, as Courtney said, this photo was taken a year, le like a little less than a year ago. And since I feel like just ever, so much has happened <laughs> in that year since I took this photo. Um, I chopped all my hair off um, and I had a baby. Uh, so it just kind of feels funny to look at this photo of me now. Um, and as she said, I'm, I'm a water bird clan, uh, a woman and a cultural worker and organizer. Um, I'm a writer and researcher in the fields of indigenous intellectual practices, something I super nerd out on, um, indigenous feminisms and gender justice, um, as well as Native American religions. My degree is in Native American religions um, and really how indigenous people incorporate spirituality and use it into everyday life. It's, it's part of who we are. 
Um, I'm a wife. I'm a brand new mama. I got a seven week old in the other room. Grandma came over to take care of him while um, I'm here in this session. Um, I'm a daughter. I'm an eldest sister. I always think that's important to say. I'm like, I'm the oldest daughter, um, oldest sister to four other siblings. And I'm a loving member of my community. So these are just some of the pictures that um, I want to show y'all. Take it away, Rev. Hi, welcome. Um, Amelia is also part of a group called Indigenesias. I want to add that. <laughs> There's a picture of her singing and playing music. Um, if, you ever, if they ever make an appearance again, um, anywhere near you, I suggest you go watch them. Um, my name is Raul Mariposa. I, uh, my great grandmother was a, curan, a, a curandera and a midwife here in what is now called San Antonio in the South side and surrounding areas. She helped birth many children, many, many children, many prayers, um, uh, many blessings, many healings. Um, um, I'm knowledgeable about cooking and garden and how we use the, that knowledge for our healing of our body, mind, and spirit. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience in childhood development as well. And I focus a lot on LGBTQIA plus two, uh, two-spirited and BIPOC healing. That's, um, what I really put a lot of my energy into. So, to me, it's all connected. And yeah, thank y'all for having me. All right. So um, if you're here in this session, uh, chances are you have already thought, at least thought about what community healing is and what community care is, right? And so, um, I want y'all to be thinking about as, as we head into the, the bulk of this session, uh, what some of your perceptions or immediate reactions when you hear these terms, right? Community healing and community care, um, you know, and just, and drop them in the chat. I'm curious. Um, I know Reb's probably curious. Um, and I see some folks here um, also on TASA's Collective Healing Initiative. We're probably, we're all very curious <laughs> about um, what, um, what, perceptions are across the state, right, um, from members um, and folks who are attending this conference, right, whether you're a member or not, uh, what your perceptions are about community healing and community care. And, and, and examples of that, right, um, that you can think of in either media, um, like the re representation in media, or in like, you know, you are a part of a collective yourself, or you are um, building capacity within your organization to, to do something like this, right? Um, and if you can't think of concrete examples of community care, um, maybe just write down what's required for something to be community care um, or community healing. Um, because maybe, and maybe those two things are different for you, right? So you can write that down to yourself, but if, if you feel, if you feel uh, called to uh, drop in the chat what some of your, your thoughts are on community healing and community care, we're curious to know. Um, and then as well, you don't have to drop this in the chat, um, but who do you think of as your, as your community, right? When, you, when I say community, it's a lot of times people, everyone, it feels like has a different connect, um, definition of what their community is. And maybe that changes depending on the circles and the spaces that you're in, right? Um, so just write down, I, I, I think it would be telling for you um, and revealing for you the first thing that pops into your head when you think of your community. Again, don't, you don't have to put it in the chat, um, but just for you. Um, so let's see. We've got mobile mammogram truck, trucks as an example of community care. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Mutual aid during the winter storm. Ooh, I still get triggered talking about that. It's yes. Mutual aid was when everything else failed, right? Community showed up for each other um, via mutual aid, right? Taking care of our people when the formal avenue structures and organizations don't. Yeah, yes, love these. The Me Too movement, hmm, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And then maybe hashtags and social media, like created, created community, mm -hmm. It makes me think of being on the reservation and gathering together, the ceremony, shared sorrow, yep, and joy, music, drums, yep. We're gonna go into all of that, right? 
having open dialogues regarding community needs and concerns. Yeah. So it seems like there's there's a mixture, right, um, of not just listening to our fellow society members, but supporting each other as well. Yeah. I find that when we ask people what what their immediate perceptions of, of community healing or community care are, a lot of times it's it is like this, you know, assessing assessing needs, right? Um, and a lot of times not so much like like a joy. Like, you know, we're, we're literally just getting together to sing or we're getting together to move our hips in a certain way that's going to make us feel alive, um, bringing awareness to local problems. Yeah, like it's, that's, that's what I find. It's interesting. Um, and we can maybe unpack that uh, later. Mm -hmm. Thank y'all. Um, and, and so because this session, we, we are going to be talking about um, Black, Indigenous, and um, other people of color, people of the global South, people of the global majority. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, ancestral wisdom models, um, specifically from this lens um, that I kind of see it as not, not a response to, um, if, if folks are familiar with like the term hegemony, right, whiteness as this thing that kind of like um, it sets a standard, right? And so for a lot of, for most, if not all Black, Indigenous, and folks of color, um, our cultural traditions, our, um, our, our knowledges and intellectual practices, right? Um, I, try to, I try to call them that, intellectual practices, because they are, a lot of times they're, when, when, some, when we do something, it's, it's cultural, right? Like, like it's kind of written off as like, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's like, you know, some brujeria or it's some, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, folk medicine or um, <laughs> it's something it's, it's relegated to um, uh, almost like, like um, it's not as important, right, as, as westernized um, healthcare or um, western intellectual practices, right, and so I just want to note that, right, for, for BIPOC folks in the room, but we've really internalized a lot of messages about um, about our own um, cultural traditions, our ancestral traditions, um, and, the, and that's due to that aspiring to whiteness, right? Um, and, and, the, and the drive to assimilate, right? Um, and so because it's rooted in, because our, our cultural knowledges and intellectual practices are rooted in a deep knowledge and relationship to land, ancestors and spiritual awareness, um, it's it's a lot of times that's that's what, always what I explain to folks like that's why uh, they were shamed right and suppressed um, it's because it it's it to be that connected right it's it's a threat it's an immediate threat uh, to the institution of whiteness and so um, hold yourself by pop folks in the room with compassion throughout this session um, as as we ask questions about land and ancestors right a lot of times sometimes these questions can be painful. Um, and so, you know, uh, and they can also remind us of, of um, you know, the beauty of our, of our traditions, right? And so wh whatever that is for you, however, um, whatever is coming up for you, I encourage you to just kind of sit with it and feel it. So for, for everybody in the room, and we're not going to be dropping this in the chat. Uh, this is more of just like a, a meditative um, space for us. But, but who are your ancestors? I mean, what are some of the values that your ancestors held, right? And for all, for all of us, right, we've got, we've got lots of ancestors, right? Um, and it's not, I encourage us to not think of in these binaries of, um, you know, indigenous and settler. Um, and it's like, we, we have to, we have to really come to these come to these places within ourselves of, of it, not just acceptance, right, but of, of a deep knowing that we, um, that we're here and we're in these bodies and all of our ancestors have brought us here. And I want us to think of maybe one remedy and a piece of wisdom or advice, some, sometimes known as dichos in uh, Latinx cultures. Um, so something that reminds you of your connection to your ancestors 
and gives you a feeling of being part of something bigger, right? Or, or spiritually and, you know, not necessarily in like a, in a religious sense, uh, but more just read that as like on, on this really deep level connected to a place and to land. So just some examples right off the top of my head, teas for certain ailments, right? Um, umbilical cord um, and placenta practices, um, birthing practices, right? A lot of times those, those, um, those come to mind when folks think about that. Songs that are codes for something, right? And, and just think about what are some of, some of the beliefs you have around those bits of wisdom. Right. What what are what are some of the things you were told about um, drinking, you know, manzanilla if you're, you know, tired? Or um, gobernadora to kind of release you got you got some ojo, somebody somebody put put something on you, you know, make a gobernadora tea. Right. What are some things that you all have, have internalized about that? So you don't have to drop it in the chat, um, but let's just go into the rest of the session thinking about that, right? All right. So we're gonna be talking about community healing and what Sanarte Healing and Cultura Clinic Collective did um, and how we kind of, how, how we started, right? And where we are now. And this is the ancestral wisdom model um, that we'll be discussing today, talking about today. So it all started actually in 2019 with a fence and a prayer. That always sounds strange to people. <laughs> Rev's like giggling, cause it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. And so the, the, the founders of the group, um, there's eight of us, right? And um, and, it, and it's, it, this, it, it was a prayer first in the sense that, um, you know, we had we have been dreaming about something like this for a really long time um, and working in community. Um, and it felt like a lot of times our whole lives were leading up to this. Um, and so it was, but we were pushed into this space of, of okay, we got to do something. Um, when one of the, an important community space um, was uh, a fence was erected right right down the middle of it um and the and really what what the hope was was to there was a lot of um, community folks actually right who uh, whose children played on this on this plaza's playground and there was a lot of foot traffic of you know um of folks who were using uh, there were needles on the playground um, and oftentimes there were uh, police officers called uh, because there was a lot of sex work activity um, at night and during the day. And so the, the solution was right a fence, a wall um, to these sort of pressing emergent human challenges, right? Um, and so we as a group, uh, um, you know, there, there was this push for, yes, we want this fence and there was this other half of, of our community that were like, no, this is terrible. Um, you know, we're all really traumatized about borders and walls and fences, like, let's just not. Um, and I think because all of those feelings were coming up, right, uh, it was, it really pushed us into the space of, well, let's be creative. Uh, how, how can we liven this space? How can we care for our community? Not just the children and elders, right, who um, are afraid to be there, but also the folks um, struggling Right, struggling with addiction um, and struggling um, with uh, being policed, right? Uh, hyper policed. That community is uh, is hyper policed, right? And so um, that that's that's what we say. Um, it began as a prayer, and it was an active response uh, and a focus on environmental health um, and fostering community resilience. That's that's really what um, we went into it with. So. So we organize community clinics. That sounds strange. Um, clinics. I think we've we've stopped using that term. Sanarte has kind of stopped. We've we'll say clinic collective, um, but I think it's clinic is associated um, with uh, things that I don't know that we necessarily wanted to be associated with. Um, 
So these are just some of the lessons learned. Um, and these are photos from that, that, that first summer. We did five, a series of five clinics um, in the summer. I don't know what we were thinking. <laughs> It was the summer. It was like 100 plus degrees. Um, and people came out by the hundreds, people from the community, right? We offered, um, uh, we, ha we did have some mid-level practitioners there. So folks that were doing STD testing, offering blood pressure, like blood, uh, blood glucose level, um, you know, check-ins with folks. Um, and we had traditional healers there, right? People offering limpias, body work, uh, which is sobadas, um, dance, healing through dance. Uh, we had folks who um, are herbalists, trained traditionally, right? And so they were um, consulting folks on, on, you know, looking at their, their whole um, cons uh, constituency and, and, and going from there, right? What, what kind of herbs can best support you right now? Um, and we had all, all of this, right? And we had children's curriculum there at the playground, right? There was always somebody there playing with the children. Um, and so this picture in the left top left corner is, is a sound a sound healing. Um, and we were we were surprised how many people uh, really came out for you know for body work, yes, for limpias, absolutely, right? You had people who were like, I am only going to be able to let go of something if somebody straight up puts a webble on me, puts an egg, right? Or smudges me, uses the feathers to, to just get this off of me, whatever it is, right? Um, but we had people who had never done something like this, um, like sound healing um, and using traditional instruments. You can see um, Michael over here has a drum and Hedas playing a flute. Um, and folks really were, went into the super vulnerable space and you know, laid on the floor and put put something over their eyes. Um, and you could hear, I remember when I would, you know, I, when I wasn't at a station, uh, you could pass by this tent and you could hear people crying. You could hear people releasing. Um, you could hear people, you know, breathing really deeply. Um, and Hera would go ahead and play instruments over people's parts of, of folks' bodies, right? And he let in uh, everybody who was playing instruments, um, it was only ever like two or three people, um, you know, let folks know what they would be doing, right? Um, but, but and, and sharing, right? Every step of the way, right? We would, this, we play this certain vibration over this part of your body, right? What are we releasing? What are we releasing when we're able to play a drum over the gallbladder or over, um, over your hips, right? If uh, over your womb, if you if you have a womb, right? Um, you know, these are these are things that that um, that folks really felt connected to and drawn to. And so it felt every clinic there was it felt like there was more people, right? After each each one, word word got out, word got around. And really, what the hope was there is is bringing together community, right? In a way that promoted community health. Um, and, and that was, you know, I think it was sad to hear a lot of, a lot of the folks say, you know, and, and not seeing, um, you know, our houseless relatives as people in dire need of protection, right? Um, it was sad to hear, you know, people wanting to call cops on, on sex workers, right, in deeply vulnerable situations. Um, and it was, and it was our, it was that response of like, oh man, like I wish, I wish we knew how to take care of each other again, right? I wish we knew how to support folks where they're at. Um, and that's, that's really what, what, um, what the spirit of Sanarte is and was in 2019. And so some of the lessons learned, um, you know, because we really wanted to have that long-term vision, you know, something that was this sort of like five clinics over the span of the summer, food bag giveaways. We did, we did end up having a funding for it, right? We fought for it at city council, actually. There was a pot of funds um, when we spoke up about, you know, we need to do something and not put up a fence, right? There, there needs to, we need to address root problems here. Um, so we did have funding, right? So these are some of the lessons learned. Uh, if there are resources to fund it, 
um, and a dedicated group of accountable to a larger vision of healing, uh, justice, abolition, you know, a, a group of folks who are committed and accountable to that, right? Uh, these large scale efforts like, like community clinics with culturally relevant offerings like limpias, um, you know, um, herbal remedy stations, cooking, ancestral food demonstrations. Oh my gosh, that, that was some, um, Reb, you gotta talk about that. But um, I mean, there, there, were, there really was something there. Like when, when folks, you know, a lot of times I think our cultural foods get shamed as well. Like, you know, oh, like, you know, especially Mexican, quote unquote, Mexican food, right? Like it's put as, as something that, you know, well, you'll get high blood pressure and, you know, you need to eat healthier. Um, and, you know, just bringing back, right, these, these um, ancestral food ways um, that are deeply connected to the land, right, but also deeply connected to our bodies um, and ancestors. And so this, all of this, right, that's doable, um, you know, if you've got all of these things, right, and oftentimes what we found it was a full-time job to organize, right, we had, like, we had our full-time jobs, the, the co-founders, right, we had, we worked, and we also organized these clinics and it was a lot. Um, it was a lot and um, and we were we wanted to do it, right? Um, and so really what we what we asked ourselves and you know really getting through the 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 thick of things, right, is what was what is the essential spirit of Sanarte um, beyond these five clinics? And what kind of more like smaller scale efforts can still meet the needs of community? Um, and you know the way we say it is at the at the intersection of access and tradition, right? Um, access is a huge part of it, um, and so tradition is as well, right? And so, um, you know, this the picture on the bottom right corner is obviously during the COVID era, right? Um, that things were always outside for us for um, you know the clinics, um, but you see we've got I think this was a this was a youth power up session. Um, so it's like movement, breath work, and sound healing um, facilitation um, in a garden, in a community garden. Um, and that's one of the elders of our tribal nation, um, Linda Jimenez, and she's there with a, with a doll um, that somebody gave her, I believe, um, at the clinics. And she was there offering limpias. Um, so... <laughs> So if, if, again, I know Courtney said it in the beginning, if folks have questions, you can ask in the chat. Um, we will also have a, an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, so, let's see. So, so really the impetus of, of thinking about why, why do we want something like this, right? Why do we want to have, uh, you know, at the intersection of access and tradition, what are, what are we talking about there? What do we mean when we say access? And that's really, um, really asking us to think beyond these systems reliant models um, and, you know, operating on the understanding that um, BIPOC folks are, are survivors of complex and oftentimes compounded trauma. I love this, this quote, it came, it came, the, the way that this quote came about is so painful. Um, but it was um, Nikita Valiero, um, she, I think this was a tweet or a Facebook uh, post after the shooting at um, mosques in New Zealand. And it's, it reads, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. Right? And I think this, this tweet and the screenshot was like shared widely. Um, and I think it really blew open. This was, when was that, 2018, 2019? Um, and it really blew open this conversation, I think, of, of community care, right? What is it um, and how do we do it better? So thinking about why, why offer alternatives to the criminal legal system as well as the Western healthcare pipeline models. And it's not, and it's not I hope that folks don't hear that we, you know, um, you know, that the criminal legal system and Western healthcare pipeline don't do anything at all to help people. That's not what we're saying, right? It's like, again, going back to that idea in the beginning, right? If, if um, our, our um, ancestral intellectual practices have been shamed, right? And it's like, almost like put on a hierarchy, right? There's like, there's Western knowledge, 
um, you know, evidence based, this and that. And then everything else is kind of put um, on this like hierarchy underneath it, right? As like folk or cultural, um, that all of these things, right, can be truths. And they can have truths to them. And so why, why do we want to offer alternatives, right? Um, it's because a lot of times these, um, these methods, especially like the Western healthcare um, models, right, are individualized. A lot of times that's not resonant for folks. Um, um, the, the oftentimes requirement of having to disclose, right, whether somebody is a survivor um, in order to receive services, right? A lot of times what we find is that um, BIPOC folks, um, you know, aren't willing to disclose or um, disclosing as something that is, is a direct or immediate threat to them and their family systems and their communities, right? And so there's a lot there, right? There's a lot to unpack even just that, right? Um, but, but we think that there's too few culturally specific and culturally relevant services and spaces for survivors, right? Regardless of whether they disclose or not. Um, and that did come up, you know, in the clinics when folks, um, you know, and they, they all share, right, that, you know, I have been holding on to this, you know, you played this instrument or, um, you know, this body worker hit a certain spot, right, and I felt, I felt this release, right, somebody said like cellular memory, right, it's like, it's like in us trauma on this cellular level is like stored in our bodies. And when um, in culturally relevant ways that is able to get worked out, right, via body work or via um, instruments, right, what, whatever the case may be, um, that those spaces are too few. And so um, because BIPOC folks um, are survivors of legacies of trauma from colonization, land theft, uh, transatlantic slave trade, Jim Crow, just to name a few, right, um, this is why, this is why we need um, alternatives. We need, um, we need options, right? For folks who don't pursue these, these paths, the criminal legal system path or the Western healthcare pipeline path. So sometimes my arrow, my next arrow works and sometimes it doesn't. So complex and historical trauma, just, you know, just really briefly, I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this. Um, but um, I always think it's funny, and somebody, somebody in a regional meeting, I think it was, I was um, Kara maybe um, in a region B meeting uh, for Tassa actually, uh, she said this just so well. Um, I think Rashna, if you're on this, I think I saw you on here Rashna, but um, that um, the field of epigenetics, right? People are just barely, had the, the Western science is really, just catching up with what uh, BIPOC folks have understood uh, for a very long time being on the, and receiving the brunt of racism um, and carrying the harm of colonization, right? Which is this idea of, of multi-generational uh, trauma, things getting passed on, right? So um, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart um, really is, is one of the, or she, she really is the uh, premier a researcher and, um, and writer on what um, historical trauma is, especially in indigenous communities, right? And she calls it the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and, and across generations emanating from massive group trauma experiences, right? And, um, and then of course, um, Dr. Joy Dubroy, Dubroy? Um, talks a lot about, and, and her research really has, has gone, I mean, it's, it's a lot, if folks want to Google this, um, post-traumatic slave syndrome being a, a condition that exists as a consequence of multi-generational oppression of Africans and their descendants resulting from centuries of chattel slavery. Um, and then, of course, followed by the institutionalized racism, which continues to perpetuate injury, right? And so um, I encourage folks, um, if you haven't heard of these, of these um, Black and Indigenous researchers um, and intellectuals um, to, yes, please look into this. Um, and um, this, is, this is really something, you know, that we need to talk about um, within our movement for sure, right? 
And so res resilience and thriving, we're gonna unpack resilience. I hope Rebel goes goes in on this term. Resilience. Also, oh, real fast, Amanda, I wanna add in too that um, this is really relevant uh, or um, very relevant, or I'm sorry, let me move on. This is important in the sense that we are like Canada about to in here and what is the United States about to go through border schools, uh, boarding schools um, for the indigenous folks and those grades are, are actually be, um, gonna be researched. And so this idea of, of trauma um, that these women have been talking about um, is something that is gonna be very prevalent um, coming up and coming down um, in our in our neighborhoods and in our people. And I think that um, it's really important that we understand um, that we do as much as we can now to understand mm -hmm. because this is, um, it's already happening for many of us as we hear these stories um, from the Canadian boarding schools. Um, and we're really dealing with that in our, in our communities here in the States. Mm -hmm. And that will only um, get a little bit stronger yet. We also know that through truth, when the truth is revealed, that's when healing really be, is also allowed to happen. So as scary as yeah. it might be, and as hard as we know it's going to be, and as painful um, and horrific and tragic, we also know that on the other side of that is peace and healing. And so um, we are, um, are uh, putting on our arms and not necessarily uh, you know, arms of, of weapons um, that you might think in a, in a Western sense, but arms and in, um, in, in our, from our heart and our soul to, to, pr to protect ourselves so that we can um, hear this information and grow from it and heal. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that, Reb. Um, and and I, re I remember seeing too, there was when, when stuff was really coming out um, from Canada, right? Um, birthing folks really like feeling this, this like ache, um, in in their wombs right and it was something that was like it was so deeply like you know triggering i had just um i was just about to give birth actually um when that first mass grave was was discovered and i just remember the dreams around that time were just yeah um so so this is this is an ongoing thing right it isn't something that um it, you know, it's, it's in history books, right? And it's something that, you know, we can just turn the page on history in our textbooks. Well, not in Texas, but, um, <laughs> we don't get, we don't get actual history here in Texas. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, I encourage folks to, to look into, um, look into this, um, and, and we'll, and we'll talk more about, about resilience. I think because, because, you know, uh, the movement for black lives, um, you know, the, the uh, pipelines getting, you know, getting, they're up and going again, right? The construction of these pipelines, mass graves, um, anti-Asian hate, right? All of this stuff is, is, is bringing up like this, this really difficult relationship to that term resilience, right? And so we're going to, we're going to talk more about this, but um so I, I want to ask you all, ask folks here, um, and, and again, you can drop this in the chat if you feel safe to drop it in the chat. Um, but really, you know, if you've got a piece of paper and you, from the meditation part at the beginning, um, you know, if you wrote something down, we're thinking about healing and thriving, right? Who, who do we consider survivors, right? Um, a lot of us are working in um, indirect services, right, in healthcare, maybe in that criminal legal system, right? So is it people who disclose? Is that, is that maybe what our immediate response is when somebody asks, well, who do we consider a survivor? People who come out and say that something, that this happened to them, so they were, sexual violence was perpetuated against them, right? But is it communities, right? Do we think of whole communities? healing deep historical wounds, including that, that compounded, right? When we say compounded, it's, it's that, that's the sexual abuse, emotional, uh, physical, right? Happening at a systems level and happening intergenerationally, um, you know, perpetuated individually and at the systems level, right? It's just like, there's so many, there's just so much, so much there, right? And, and who does the anti-sexual violent movement serve? 
I think this this question I have asked myself personally. You know, I, I mean, I work at Tasa, right? So um, I ask myself this: I'm a survivor myself, right? Who does the anti-sexual violence, move, violence movement serve, and how do we think of ourselves within these systems, right? If we're BIPOC folks, if we're white, if we are advocates, if we are, um, you know, if we're uh, healthcare providers. How do we think of ourselves within these systems? And so these are, you know, these photos here are, um, every, everybody in these photos, I was, as I was putting this presentation together, it was like, everybody in these photos, I know, I know people, we all know people, right? Who are survivors of sexual violence and maybe have not, have never said this, right? Maybe said it to one person. I would never have gone to seek therapy or to seek um, anything in, that would require that they check off a box, right? And they are worthy of, of healing, right? Even the people who don't check off that box. Well, yeah, Maria, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Margaret wrote in the chat, I feel like everyone has been a survivor of something, whether they voiced what's happened to those or those keeping it inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. so, absolutely. My mother always says yeah. that we're under such a colonized space, we are all um, suffering under PTSD. So yeah, I agree with you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, th I think, and this again, won't spend a ton of time on this, but I think it is important to note, right? And when we're talking about alternatives and options um, for survivors, right? It's this reminder that, you know, 2020, definitely, um, if, if 2014 and 2015 and all the different, uh, you know, uh, moments that the Movement for Black Lives blew open this conversation in particular, um, all the times before that, right, that not everyone calls the cops, right? And this, this is a reality maybe that people are just starting at like a mainstream level to really think about, right? So I, I put these in here because I was like, you know what, the, there, is, there is narrative out there in like, you know, you can watch Pose on Netflix. If you got an HBO Max subscription, you can watch Lovecraft Country, right? And showing, not in a documentary style, I think uh, everyone is, is I, I mean, I am very burnt out from a lot of these documentaries that just show trauma, the trauma and pain and suffering of Black, Indigenous, um, and folks of color, right? Um, but I think that, that certain TV shows and movies have, they weave this reality into the story, right? As sort of matter of fact, right? And Pose, um, you know, we've got, uh, it's, it's uh, the, trans, um, the trans folks of color, right? And the systems and, and community care uh, in the 80s, right, during the HIV and AIDS epidemic, that, you know, they don't call the cops, right? But they've got, they've got these systems, they've got these pods, um, and, and ways that they take care of each other, um, and get them to, to, to healthcare appointments, right? Um, but it's, it's really, it, it's really about, with this reality, right, having more options for healing and safety outside of, of these systems that would, um, either out or, um, or, or really on a, on a deep level harm um, the person who is, is seeking help, right? And, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color have known that these systems more times than not do not serve them, right? And, these, and in these shows, I think that they, you know, it, and if folks are like, if something's coming to your mind, again, not a documentary, right? Something that is like, yeah, this is, this is we've we've known this. All right, let's let's move on. This is this is how we this is what we do about it, right? Um, and this is how it looks, right? Lovecraft Country. If you haven't seen it, it's it's insane. It's it's beautiful and and wild, um, but it's also um, it's definitely something that is um, uh, it's got that really at the heart, right? That um, the the reality of Black folks um, in in the U.S. in particular. So if you have if you have an example in contemporary media, not everyone calls the cops, drop it in the chat. All right. So take it away, Riv. 
We'll be talking about navigating pandemic, and we've been here before. De la Animo and Land Care Days. Okay, thank you, Amelia. Okay, if we've kind of been sitting here for a moment, so I'm gonna invite you all to maybe stretch a little bit, stand up, or use your arms, you know, and just kind of, you know, shake your shoulders out um, wherever you're at. Um, yeah, exactly. Do a little dance. Um, <laughs> just kind of let that blood flow. Maybe take a couple of breaths. Deep breath in and deep breath out. Get some oxygen to the brain <laughs> and to the be and to the behind, right? Since it's just sitting there, <laughs> you lift your legs up or something. Um, just shake them around so that we can get some things flowing. Um, so. Um, we, this is a familiar uh, space for me, um, uh, not pre-pandemic like most of us, but the Zoom spaces, um, because as San Arte, we were doing physical clinics, as Amelia was telling us, um, where we were in a plaza, in a, in a city-owned uh, park, and it was, so we were able to phys physically work with folks, and then the pandemic hit, and that changed, yet the healing was needed even more, right? Because the isolation was um, so strong. And, you know, the trauma didn't go away. And if anything, it got compounded. Um, so, you know, we, you hear things like telehealth. Well, we came up with something called teleanimo. And animo is like, um, like to give energy, to, to give yourself some spark, right? Um, and perhaps the interpreters have, have uh, interpreted a little bit different, but uh, are, are better. So, but to me, that's how I feel about when I think of, of that, of animo, it means to give energy to something. Um, maybe to like put a battery in it in a way, right? To kind of keep it moving. And, um, and so one thing we also talk about a lot in um, with San Arte, whether it's on screen or in public, is um, the realities of vicarious trauma, um, but also vicarious healing, right? And, and so, so many of us are, are in agreement with the paradigm that if you see someone um, that is traumatized, let's say you see someone um, being abused, that if you are in that room, that you are also an experience of that trauma. Yet we don't really subscribe to the paradigm that if you are in a room of where someone is being healed, that you are also experiencing healing. And so that is what we are talking about here when we speak of vi a vicarious healing, is that um, when one of us heals, we all begin to heal. Right? So in one way um, you can think about it um, is, uh, my mother will talk about it in a sense of a, of a reboso, which is like a shawl, right? And the shawl is, is weaved together with many, with many threads, um, and you're a thread and I'm a thread, and we make up this beautiful universe as, as the human species. And um, if you heal, I get to heal, right? And so um, that is that bigger idea of, of, of what we're doing. So um, maybe if a shawl isn't something you use, maybe you could think of it as a blanket or a blouse or something that is weaved that represents our connectedness. And um, if, uh, if Amelia is experiencing healing even in her home, and I'm aware, or maybe setting a candle as she's giving birth, I realize that I'm a part of the ceremony of what is happening, of bringing this child into this side of, of our world, right? And, and so uh, vicariously uh, working with one another, with each other, right? And so sometimes we have to get out of, you have to see it to believe it, or this very physical three-dimensional world. And so I think to go back to what Amelia spoke of in the beginning about trying to fit our, our, our medicinal practices, our intellectual practices, our cultural practices into a, a Caucasian or white or European centric theme, um, we don't have to fit in to be validated. And in fact, we find that often when we try to fit in, it doesn't work for us because we don't, uh, they're not, uh, we weren't created in those paradigms. We, our thought processes, our beliefs, our danzas, our, our songs, our, our food was created from a different, a different ceremony, from a, a different vibration. 
And not to say that there's not beautiful, traditional indigenous people from parts of Europe, there are. Um, and I always encourage folks um, to, 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 you know, if you're from the Europe descent, keep going because you've got some indigenous somewhere. So keep going until maybe you're linked to the Swamis or somewhere from, you know, um, what is now the um, Sweden. And, you know, so uh, it's there, it's there. So for all of us. Um, and so, yes, we talk about a vi uh, vicarious healing. And let me see this next it says, if we hope to invest more in the transformation of systems, how can we start at a grassroots level with our cultural wisdoms and ancestral knowledge informing our work? Um, so yeah, how can we do this, right? Um, and that's what Sunday they did. We literally said, hey, we know we have this information. We know it's been passed down uh, either through our own direct ancestors, whether it was our grandmothers or great grandmothers, uh, whether they were biologically our grandmothers or if they were just grandmothers of the community of the band, right? Or our grandfathers. We knew that we have we had been passed down some very sacred information, traditional information um, from mainly when we when we speak of traditional, we speak of what you know the Turtle Island, which is North and, and South America, also with the understanding of uh, that um, many through slave, you know, the slave trade that there was, there's a lot of, of traditional as well that has come in from that way that mixes in. And so it's, um, we know through migration of people, whether uh, by choice or, or force that um, there it's, uh, we, when we recognize, so when we say traditional, if I say traditional turtle island, I want you to know that I also recognize that it's not just, um, that there was a mix of, of, of lots of people coming in and sharing. Um, their jarabes, um, their bailes, and 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 we practice those things now, and we share those things now. And so we were like, we have to do this because it's either we own the knowledge and we answer the prayers of our grandmothers, living and from the past, or we or we just let the fence be put around this park. And so we had to rise to the occasion put our egos aside, put our doubts, put our fears. We all had them. And we had actually a lot of us until we created San Arte, um, where we're kind of quietly keeping our skills in our in our information, you know, to a small group of people. And so we, we, we said, we can't do this anymore. We have to open up. And we did. And like Amelia had said, there was an influx of hundreds of people, hundreds of people. We did it once a month for five months and we saw hundreds of people. Um, and it was beautiful, it was hot, it was intense, it was exhausting, um, but it, it was also cleansing and healing and fun and uplifting and needed and needed. And it was something that the city was never going to do on their own, or at least not in the next 20 years. We had to go to city council. We had to sit in meetings with chiefs of staffs who we kind of understood, maybe they understood, or maybe like, oh yeah, I remember when my grandma would light a candle, you know, or, or say a prayer over me when I had an upset stomach. And so we would just try to tie into a little bit of, of some sort of, um, that something they could relate to. To, to let them know, hey, let us, let, we need to do this, let us do it. And because there's that memory, whether it's, whether they were a child or their mother had a memory, that relatability kind of, that kind of, you know, we spoke to it and they were like, okay, let, we're gonna do, we're gonna let y'all do this. And we're not just gonna let you, but we're gonna fund you. We have city funds for healing. We have city funds for health. Um, and uh, so let's try it. And they, put, they went on a limb, we went on a limb. And, um, and we started the, the clinics and it was beautiful. Um, and, and then, okay, so the next thing we're talking about here is BIPOC, BIPOC folks are amazing and resilient and worthy of creativity and expansive possibilities of a future made by us and for us. So um, we, I, when Amelia and I were talking about this slide, I wanted to talk about the world re resilient because I've been seeing a, on social media how, you know, some, some folks are like, I don't wanna be resilient anymore. And, um, and I get that, you know, some of us, we don't want to be resilient. We just want to like live in joy and happiness and peace. And, um, and we're, we're, that's what we're striving for. And it's, 
you know, I think that resilience is something that we can have, but it, we've had to be it under the current regimes and paradigms. And, but yes, we do want to shift away from having to be resilient 24 um, seven, 365. 500 years kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. You know, you want to be resilient every once in a while, every blue moon where you have to, you know, so um, let's, let's prayers up for that. And so, okay, so let's move on and talk about the animal. So we're in this, we go from this physical space to then going, we have to go virtual and we create the animal and we base it on the four elements. We know that we can do healing through earth, air, water, and fire. And we break the class up into a five-week course. Each uh, The first week is an intro, and then we go through the elements. And as we go through the elements in each week, we talk about healing. We, If we're, if we're talking about earth, then we're also, we also give people a, a medicine bag where they have an oil, a tea, a, something to smudge with, and a spray so we can represent each element and each element um so each week we go through the element we teach them how to use the medicine we have uh, we, we talk about movement we do kinam which is um perhaps more most people are, are used to maybe the word yoga um or and kinam is is a mexican version of that where we talk about the 13 sacred joints in our body and how we need to move them in order to uh, live in a happy healthy physical form we did breath work and writing prompts, visual tech, is a lot of visualization as well to, to initiate the writing prompts and the plant medicine. And it was over five weeks and they were made, I think the biggest group we had was, I think one facilitator had about 10 people. So most of the, most of the classes were either five to 15 people and they were all done via Zoom. And we didn't record them, of course. It was very uh, personal things that were being shared. The first, uh, we did three of these. So we did, I believe we started in um, maybe February. Then we did it uh, again in March and um, April. And so we, and we're continuing to do them. So we haven't stopped. We took a little break in July and we're going to continue to go on. So the first one I did, uh, with Vanessa Quesada, who's also a co-founder. And we really focused on um, just the elements and kind of getting people back into this ancestral knowledge and, and hearing where they were at. And then second to that, the second one, I had a, a calling to do it, focus on releasing guilt. So I, um, as someone who's uh, queer and two-spirited myself, I understand um, how much guilt plays um, in, in, in sickness. Um, in the community. And so it's really important for me to focus the next two Zen Animal sessions that I did with Sanate on releasing guilt. Where does it get stored in the body? How can we release it? Why do we even have it? Where did it come from? What can we learn from it? You know, I, I, I tell people in the beginning of that course, I'm not going to cure you of guilt. You might feel guilty later, you know, uh, but I'm going to give you some tools so that you don't feel guilty all the time or that you don't let it get stuck in your body. So, um, so that yeah, that's what we that's the last uh, two del animal sessions. We're focused and working um, with uh, the. I've only had women actually sign up for the release because no, I mean it's not a very fancy or fun title, you know. Oh, <laughs> release guilt, you know. <laughs> it's a hard one, but um, so we had when we have different themes and we have different facilitators. So um, it's been beautiful. It's been helpful. We do surveys before and after to get insight on where people are starting from and then where where have what have they gained at the end and where do they see themselves going um, and so it is our goal to empower people to let them know that they have their healing knowledge within them and so we've uh you know we even ask people is this something you see yourself doing would you facilitate that animal you know so we feel like it, it we're not gatekeepers we're not the only ones who have this knowledge or that can do this it's just a matter of empowering ourselves and each other to um understand that we have the knowledge and the wisdom within us to, to heal ourselves and to help others heal so that's the animal and the next thing we did uh as a group or ongoing 
um, this is something that happened at the same time that Alamo was happening, we're doing land care days. Um, it was part of our mission at the foundation of the San Arte Healing and Cultura movement is reclaiming our responsibility to the land and all the elements. We remember how to caretake the land by working alongside the elders who have maintained this generational connection. So we have uh, a couple of elders who own some properties outside of San Antonio. And so uh, there's a Thunderbird Ranch that we've gone and helped uh, Theo Louie at, and they needed to, um, it wasn't just, oh, let's plant some vegetables. It was also these elders that said, hey, you know, I, I need to organize my shed because I have, um, it, it, you know, I have an inspection coming up and I need help. You know, they have this beautiful knowledge, this deep knowledge, this is, you know, um, about caring for the land that could be lost if we lose them. So it wasn't just like, oh, well, show us how to plant. It was, what do you need? We asked them what can we do for you? And that was one of the land care days. That's what it was. It was literally moving pieces of wood from one side to the other side and cleaning. And, um, and it was rough, but it, you know, it was beautiful. And you see some of the photos or, you know, one of the times we are planting there and they're planting, working with the land, putting their hands in the dirt, uh, different generations from the littlest ones, to middle to, to the elders. Um, that are coming and we're finding that we're getting a pretty consistent group of people that is the, the ones uh, who, who have come before are coming again so they are being very they're attracted to what we're doing here um it speaks to their spirit it is helping them heal so sometimes we understand that healing doesn't have to be necessary necessarily olympia it can be literally just planting something in the earth letting your hands touch the mother again getting your fingernails dirty, uh, sweating it out, uh, laughing alongside someone, help, you know, uh, lifting, you know, something heavy with someone else, learning how to drive a tractor. Um, all these things um, are helping our community members heal. And we do, there's some storytelling, there's sh there was share some songs, there's drumming, um, yeah, you can see the children. Um, yeah, so these are all are all form of community care. And yes, what else do we got next? Okay, BIPOC led healing via land connection. Land connection is oftentimes for BIPOC folks a loaded or painful idea due to the realities of colonization, land theft, privatization of land, and being descendants of slaves who were forced to work the land as well as who were given land and then taken, the land was then taken away from them. Uh, sometimes we find that because of these realities, that connection is even more intense. Um, if you're white, what are some black led indigenous and indigenous led and people of color led land stewarding and reclaiming initiative near you that you can contribute to? So do you even know anyone in your community that are doing these things? And if you do, help fund them work with them, be their allies. And if you don't, we'll start looking for it, research it, you know, internet it and, and find out because I'm pretty sure no matter where you're at, there is there is some sort of group doing this work. Um, it, it, we, we see it all over um, what is now called the United States. So you can, I'm sure you can find it wherever you're at. And uh, BIPOC folks, how can you begin to see yourself healing in a community via connection to land and ancestors? Um, if there is something you already do, oh yeah, share it with us in the chat. And yeah, by BIPOC folks only. So if you are uh, self-identified as a BIPOC and you are doing something already to connect with the land and your ancestors, please put it in the chat and Maya, uh, said Tiffany Washington is doing some stuff in the Austin area. So if you're in what is now called Austin, find Tiffany Washington. And so yeah, if you are y'all doing stuff, if you're BIPOC and you're out there, are you doing stuff to connect to the land? Um, let us know. Um, and if, if you're not yet, well, we hope you can. Even if it's a house plant, that's connection to the land. Um, uh, perhaps there's a neighbor an elder neighbor, even something as simple as that. It doesn't have to be some designated indigenous elder, BIPOC elder. It can be, you know, the, the grandmother down the block or in the, in the grandmother and the grandfather in the uh, apartment down from you or something. That is 
a connection to ancestral knowledge, um, helping them is, is a way to, to find back that connection um, because we're so deconnected right now and, and that's where a lot of our unhappiness is coming from. And so it's really important that we get back, back to the mother um, and, and put our hands and, and share and listen to the stories um, and the songs and the birds and the trees, right? And, and it's so, I always get so mad because for so long, you know, I was saying this and, and back in the day, in the 80s and 90s, you were like, oh, you're such a hippie. You're such a hippie. And I'd be like, that's just because we always, again, it goes back to that first slide. We always relate everything to whiteness. It's like, I'm not a hippie. I'm indigenous. This is indigenous stuff, you know? And so I can't stand that. But, um, you know, sometimes that's what we think. We're like, oh, that's so hippie. I don't want to be some white granola. Well, don't be a white granola, you know, be a brown black, you know, uh, like gumbo or like, fry bread you know like it's it's all good um so it's it's a matter of shifting those paradigms and and taking our power back and taking our our um our our ways of living back and then sharing them again and saying okay you know i i can do this i love it and i want to share it so yes oh yeah i love some gumbo too and um and so i'm growing okra actually currently right now um in, in my backyard, this okra is like almost 10 feet tall. Uh, my okra plant, I don't know what's going on. I just love the rain and the heat. So we got 15 minutes. Um, I wanna read what Margaret wrote. Um, Antoinette wrote, Rebecca, I'm in the DFW area now, but I'm from the Tyler area. Okay, cool, thank you. And then Margaret wrote, I've spoken with clients that feel lost as they feel their families have lost their traditions due to earlier generations being shamed for sharing them. For some of them, they don't know what community uh, they are a part of. How would you recommend they go about figuring that out? Mm. Amelia, do you want to? Yeah, and I guess as a point of, of clarification, Margaret, and, and we can also, um, there's there's just like a couple of other things um, left in the presentation um, I definitely want to talk about. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we said it earlier, as well, right? The, a lot of times land connection, right? And ancestors is, is, you know, people think, oh, you know, BIPOC folks, you know, got, you know, have these deeply rooted traditions and, um, and that's oftentimes not the case, right? It's like, um, you know, folks are not invited into or benefiting from whiteness, right? But also it feeling like, I don't, I don't know who my people are, right? Or because because of the realities of um, oh my gosh who is it Kim Tallbear she has this like really badass way of putting it and now it's escaping me but uh, oh genomic articulations of indigeneity right that were these like percentages or something right mm -hmm. and because of that worldview a lot of times people feel like I mean even this idea of like oh like I'm half this and half that right and it's like I mean you're you're like a whole person, right? And you have ancestors from here and you have ancestors from there, right? Um, when we kind of like um, fraction ourselves off like that, right? And having that be, that's like a super Western science um, worldview, right? Genomic articulations of indigeneity, right? That where I'm, I'm 55, I took a DNA test and I'm 55% Native American, right? Um, that's actually not how Native people uh, talk about ourselves, right? Uh, that's actually not how we ascribe belonging into our communities, right? Uh, and it's something that is, I think, it's it's interesting, right? And so I, I don't know that I have um, advice or any guidance necessarily for folks who, um, you know, who are maybe counseling people who don't know who, who their people are, right? Or don't know who their communities are, right? Other than to just kind of hold the space for that to, to be the painful thing that it is. Um, and trust that, you know, that, um, you know, in guiding them through this process, right? Um, I, I personally have to let go of like, uh, um, what do you call it? Like uh, setting something up like, oh, this sounds, this sounds a little woo. Or it sounds a little, ugh, it sounds a little out there, but um, you know, I an elder grandmother has told me before that you know uh, 
when you when you start going down that that road right of like who are my ancestors right and you and you and you would like to connect with ancestors right the dreams get wild and like <laughs> the st stuff like that right inviting inviting dreams to come to you right um, and having that be something that that's 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 an ancestral and it's an indigenous intellectual practice right really specifically putting an attention down for dreams who are my ancestors who are my people right um, and and again I mean I think it is something you know that was that was a, a teaching shared to me by uh, you know by a grandmother um, and I think that that that's something that is um, you know it's different for everybody right whatever your teachings are whatever your cultural traditions and practices are you know guiding guiding you that's that's what I would that's what I would advise right and for folks right who um, who are adopted right this is also this can also be a really painful um, or like big question mark right um, and I think that although, you know, genomic articulations of indigeneity are ultimately harmful for indigenous communities, I think that a lot of times people find that those DNA tests, um, if you're adopted, for example, right, that they can, they can restore something that feels lost or restore or allow you to feel a connection that maybe you didn't have before, right? And so holding all of those things with nuance and complexity, right? Because I wrote, I used to, in grad school, I'd write like whole papers, just like shitting on DNA tests and how horrible they are. Um, and they're horrible in the sense that, you know, they, they rob the autonomy of indigenous people on how we name ourselves, right? But I, I also recognize there that nuance and complexity of folks who, who may not know who their people are, right? Um, due to these, uh, due to the realities of colonization, due to, um, you know, uh, forced separations, right? We're talking about boarding schools and all that kind of stuff, right? So that, that's, there was, there was child separation there, right? And we see that today, right? Um, these realities of child separation, um, down, down our lineages, um, maybe it was our, our parents and grandparents, our grandparents, right? So holding all of that, um, thank y'all for, yeah, thank you, Maya, for writing that. I'm like, can you tell I this was like my grad school stuff there? I think we have one more bubble, investing in BIPOC community care. Yes, and it's, it's really just like, yeah, how you can support, right? Um, and if you would like to take a screenshot of this, please feel free. These are all Instagram accounts and websites. Um, and I do want to leave some time time for questions um, if folks have it. And I don't know that we that we are doing like the unmute yourself questions, but um, I'm not entirely certain. So maybe Courtney or uh, Madison or Maya, if you want to maybe just uh, clarify on that. But um, you know, these are these are folks um, locally here, and then this is locally as in the San Antonio area. These are folks that um, Sanarte has worked with before really closely, uh, and that you know we're like. We co-sign, they're good, they're cool, um, they're legit. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta like, are they legit? Um, <laughs> so these, these are some folks, some suggestions, right? To give to, right? Venmo accounts are listed on all of their Instagram pages. Um, so give, hire and connect, right? Hire indigenous and black led consulting and capacity building collectives and businesses for your org, right? If your org is really wanting to do, um, you know, more on, um, culturally affirming, culturally rooted, um, or, um, you know, just bu building, building your capacity within your organization for indigenous models of leadership, right? Um, social justice oriented, um, frameworks for trainings, for prevention, for all of that, right? Um, there's, these are some folks on Arte does that as well. We do circles, um, for organizations. Um, and everyone has their own rates, right? Um, and connect, connect with Sanarte, right? We'll have, a, we have a little slide with contact info. Um, you know, we love um, connecting and building with folks, healing minded folks, as we say. Um, and so we're always, we're always um, willing and open to hear uh, what, what you're doing, right? And how maybe we can plug in there. So I love that picture of Erika Rev of, of her making that altar at the clinic. It's like so beautiful. I always remind yes. them like, oh, 
I yeah, I mean, we always had an altar centered uh, first thing we started before we started any clinic. Um, once you create the altar. Yes. All right. So these are just some loving recommendations. Again, probably screenshot. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, these were all, we had these on our Instagram account. My husband actually is the artist. Drew, these are all of the, these are his renditions of the co-founders. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, Rib. I was like, do you know which one you are? I don't. I mean, am I the one holding the thing up, the plant? Yeah. <laughs> Michael was like, Michael was like, I, I swear I saw her one time. She was like, she was like, power. And she had a radish in her hand or something like that. He has like that memory of <laughs> you. So anyway, um, that's me with the dogs. I'm just kidding. I do. I do. Those are my dogs. But um, yeah, so take a screenshot. Um, and we're going to just um, open it up for questions in the chat. This is our contact information. You can reach us via email. Uh, follow us on Instagram and visit our website. Um, do we have do we have questions? We we covered it. Wait, am I muted? We covered everything. So y'all are just good, right? Y'all know. <laughs> You're gonna go on and, and create your cl your clinics in your own in your own neighborhoods and report back. <laughs> good. <laughs> Those are yeah. excellent Thank presenters. You, Olivia. <laughs> yes. A lot of gratitude coming in from, from the chat. Any questions, y'all? Feel free to unmute or post it in the chat. You can also email uh, the questions to sign at the community at gmail.com if you feel like you want to ask something later. Thank you for your time and your energy and your attention. Most importantly, you know, we realize how precious your time is. And thank you for spending some of it with us today. We hope that we were able to uh, fill your cup a little bit. Um, so that it can overflow with love and healing and joy. Oh, uh, we do not have merch for sale as of right now, but we're going to get on that. <laughs> I know. I was like, hmm, I mean, this is a good question, Olivia. <laughs> yeah. I want a shirt that says, I am gumbo. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, you I'm are. Sorry. Yes, you are. <laughs> Love it. Great. Please remember to leave this feedback in our in the feedback form that you'll get as soon as you close out of this uh, presentation. Please take some time to fill that out. Um, Tasa would love to hear what you thought about this session. So in the future, we have sessions like this. Um, and opportunities for folks to continue to engage in these conversations. Fill out the form and while you're filling it out, you can listen to the Spotify uh, playlist that they created. <laughs> yes. So hiya. Thank you, Madison, for reposting the information. Yes, please fill out the evaluation. And just so you know, at the end of the conference, there will be an overall evaluation and you should submit it because you will get a certificate for attendance as well as be entered into a drawing to receive a free conference registration for 2022. Wonderful job, y'all. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Rebel. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. all I'll still leave it open for the next three minutes in case anyone decides in the last, last minute. <laughs> that they have an inquiry. Thank you, Marsa. Glad that we're uh, affirming your path. Also, thank you again to our interpreters. Yes. Thank you, Susana and Asusina. Gosh, shout out to the Collective Healing Initiative folks in the room. I see y'all. I haven't seen y'all in two months, but I see you. Mm -hmm. And more to come on that Collective Healing Initiative. Yeah. Enjoy that cup, Melanie. I'm glad it's raining over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
You know, if you wanted to show us a baby, you would be mad. <laughs> Someone, asked for pics. Someone asked for pics at the beginning, and the first thing in the chat was, where are the baby pics? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely oh, came Oh, my up. gosh. Well, like, he's my background right now. I'm like, oh, my baby. <laughs> Wait, are there baby pics? I need baby pics. <laughs> I, I'm like, right. Okay, it's, 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 is it a BIPOC space without baby pics? Surely not. No, <laughs> Surely. Not. Oh my gosh. I have this actually. Okay. This is not going to be great quality, but I have to show this video to y'all. Can everybody hear this? Oh my gosh. He he is totally a singer. I mean, we knew it with that cry. We're like, you got some lungs, man. We're <laughs> gonna start teaching you songs. That was so lovely. Thank you for sharing that. I was like, oh wow, there's actually still a lot of people here. Well, <laughs> folks, I'm about to close us out. <laughs> But I think ending on the baby was, that was perfect. <laughs> baby medicine is real. Thank you all so much for being here. We hope to hear yeah. from folks soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.